curse of the pod yeah it's becoming real i wish you hadn't said it i don't think i would have realized it it's becoming very real and i'm starting to think that maybe you just tricked me into coming out on this and like that there were no fish there's no fish no but you we know there's fish you tricked me well so far now i've gotten you to come all the way to weaverville which Twice. no one literally ever yeah. comes to <laughs> for a hunting and fishing trip. And we've got no deer and literally no steelhead after three days. One of, steelhead. One, one half pounder. One half pounder. After six man days of fishing on the Trinity River, which, you know, people get skunked on the Trinity all the time. Yeah. Not me, but people get skunked all the time on the Trinity River. Three days in a row of fishing? Two people. This is bad. I don't know. I don't know. I don't... I don't know how to take it. Both, I would say, not expert fishermen, but lifelong fishermen. Yeah. Um, both at various points in our lives have been, like, obsessed with fly fishing and, like, really, really done, like, deep dives mm-hmm. into the sport. Um, you steelhead fished up here almost your whole life. Mm-hmm. I spent, like, five years of my life, like, hyper-focused on Great Lakes steelhead, which is really, like, the same. The, the, the techniques are the same. The equipment's the same. Everything's the same except these fish are in salt water. Those ones are in the Great Lakes. Yeah. We can't we can't also underestimate how particular rivers do just have their own like character and styles, even if it's very minute, you know? Yep. And this was your first time fishing it. Mm-hmm. But you outfished me by a long shot. In in a way. It depends on how you define. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, even so, two very serious fishermen on this river for six man days and nothing to show for it is pretty sorry. And I will say also, like, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be, like, an expert fly fisher or not because I'm having this moment of intense insecurity. We are not expert fly We're not. But, you know, before this trip, I might have rated myself a lot higher than I do now. And it's sort of not just because... Of the fact that I didn't catch anything in three days of fishing. But I feel like talking to Irv really humbled me. Yeah. In a pretty intense way. Yeah. When you come across people who are true experts. Yeah. It kind of puts you in your place. Yeah. And they're just like, I, when I, after that conversation, I remember on the river fishing and feeling like that there are so many layers of posiordom <laughs> or something. Yeah. You know? like, yeah. like there's so... Like, you might be an expert compared to someone else. They might be an expert to someone compared to someone else. But then we, after meeting Herb, like, suddenly feel like I felt like a child or something. Like, I knew nothing about the Trinity River, which is a river I thought I knew pretty well. Yeah. There's always so much more to learn, though. There is. It's crazy. He's been fishing this river for 53 years and has made his living off of this river. Like, think about that. That's, this is his job. Think about all, like, if you were to measure information like they do with computers in terms of bits of information, mm-hmm. how many bits of information you have about coyotes and your PhD project and ecology and anthropology and filmmaking, mm-hmm. all those bits of information. Me, all my information I have about chemical engineering and math and science and the oil business. Mm-hmm. And we are only 30 years old. (laughs) 
he's 53. So he's a lot longer career. And that this is his job. Like he has so much. His more, job and his life his and his job passion. And his life and his passion. Like how many bits of information he has in his brain. Yeah. Compared to, and then how many bits of information we have about fly fishing compared to that. Yeah. No, I mean. It's, it's a it's tiny true. fraction. Because what we, do, we fish for leisure. It's his job. It has almost, been for over 50 years. It was almost overwhelming to talk to him because it, I was just like in awe of the knowledge that he had. But it also wasn't just coming through in like what he was saying. It was somehow like in his like whole style of talking about the river, like in his like passion and in like it was between all the words too, you know, yeah. he just felt like he had like a very intuitive, natural sense of what goes on on the river. Yeah. That was even like beyond his ability to communicate it to us. Yeah. It was very cool. Very cool. Not that helpful for like a, okay, how do I go catch a fish? No, I know. Totally. But I almost thought that was part of it. He didn't want to like give us, just give us the answer. Yeah. He was almost kind of trying to inspire us to just, like, look more closely. Well, he really wanted us to fish dry flies. And I tried to say it in no uncertain terms that I was not going to fish dry flies. <laughs> well, okay, so let's, let's, go, let's go into that. Because one of the things I was really inspired by from what he told us was that, like, he kind of uses these, what, we might, what one might call, like, more purist methods. Like, he's doing sw- swinging streamers. Definitely He's doing purist. dry flyer using dry flies and he was sort of like looking down on people who he like even imitated people doing this going down the river he was just like who are like just dunking their their nymphs in the big pools and he yeah. like moved back and forth like he was like moving to each side of the drift boat or whatever yeah and then you were <laughs> i remember we were talking we were like well yeah that's exactly what i'm gonna do <laughs> yeah so what was i want him to tell me what nymphs to use yeah, that's yeah. why i add that's where we like the, the whole point of this conversation and then he starts making fun of nymph fishing. He I'm was like, a cryptic prophet. So he was a cryptic prophet. So which nymph do I use? So what was your strategy going into this? Um, I wanted to fish. I was going to nymph. My whole objective was to catch a big Pacific run steelhead. And <laughs> God, don't say it like that. the highest like probability of reaching that goal was by nymphing. With bobbers and weights. Thing about so, bobbers. Thing about bobbers. And split shots. Thing about bobbers and split shots. If you want to get down and dirty and put some fish in the creel, that's the way to do it. Why? Why? Yeah, like why is, why did you think that is the most successful method? Or have you have the best odds with that method? Um personal experience on the Great Lakes. Mm-hmm. Um having talked to you about fishing on the trinity your entire life yeah that's how you do it it's mostly how i've done it which Um, i'm actually kind of ashamed that i've even though it's worked for me i wish i now i kind of want to explore other strategies even though they might not be as successful but that's for another what were all the people in the drift boats doing most of them were nymphing yeah i mean drift boat i think in particular is easier is easier to nymph yeah what were most of the people that we ran into well, those, guys, those guys at the end were swinging. I know. I said, what are most people doing? Yeah, indicators. Indicators. Um, from what I've read from the media I've consumed, if you want to put fish away, fish, bobbers, and weights. So that's what I did. I also love, like, I don't, like, there's no part of me that's, like, conflicted about doing that. Yeah. Like, I'm doing this <laughs> because... It's like a leisure activity. I'm out here to have fun. Um, and I have a ton of fun fishing bobbers and weights. Like, I love watching the indicator. I love, like... The Zen mm-hmm. Buddhist indicator. Yeah. I love, <laughs> like, learning how to manipulate your line to perfect the d- drag feed free drift. Like, I just, like, I find it, like, endlessly enjoyable and fascinating. And it also happens to be the most productive method. So that was my strategy. Yeah. Would you ever, would you have moved to a dry fly or a streamer if you would have been catching fish on the nymph just for fun or no? Probably. Like what would make you, would you ever use, I know you enjoy nymphing and you've gone into the Zen Buddhism of staring at the bobber all day and like that's your meditative yeah. practice, which I think is cool. But in any other circumstance, would you ever 
yeah. switch to a less successful method because for whatever reason. If it's more fun or because yeah. you wanted to practice different things. If I found it to be more fun, I would do the others. Yeah. I just wonder how much of nymphing is fun to you because you know you're likely to catch a fish. Yeah. It's part of it. Yeah. I also find like the practice of nymphing in itself to be fun. I get it. A good drift is... Oof. It's satisfying in itself, you know? Yeah. Like, you get that, like, little, like, rush of dopamine. Yeah. Like, that little drip of dopamine, like, every time you get, like, a really good drift. Totally. Like, a big, long, perfect drift. And, like, or even, the, like, that perfect mend. You know, like, when mm -hmm. you just, like, get that one mend mm -hmm. that was just, like, perfect. Alternatively, I had some moments this weekend, which I have to say, like, I didn't catch fish, but I also would give myself, like, a B- minus in terms of how I fished. I don't know why, if I was distracted, thinking about other things or whatnot. B minus being a bad grade for you. Yeah. I don't get Bs, Steve. Okay. B minus being bad. Meaning, like, I feel like I was... I feel like when I grade, like, if I were to, like, grade the Patriots or, like... Last night grade on the, the game. Bruins. No, but outside <laughs> of that. Okay. Like, if I'm, like, grading something in life, like, a C is, like, average. Okay, so you're like coming from so like organic chemistry. Like if just like played okay and like won the game and you know had some good things, had some bad things, but they won. Like that would be like a C performance. So you're coming from organic chemistry. I'm coming from like Yale, where all the grades are inflated. So like everyone gets A's except like the <laughs> real dumbasses get B's. <laughs> but so you're saying that you don't think you fished all that well this trip? I didn't. I don't think I did. Yeah. But that's that said like. As good, what I mean, what I meant to say is like a, as good as a good drift feels when you're like not mending right or like you're getting tangled. Like what kept happening to me is, is when I would like cast or mend or something, I would get these loops that would happen where my line would come like my below the indicator would come over and like over the fly line oh, no. and then get, get tangled oh. with. That's disgusting. Don't even talk like that. <laughs> Dude, it doesn't usually happen to me that much, but it kept happening to me over and over again. And I also got this blister on my hand, which me made me think something is off. Yeah, dude, you need to go out and do some yard work or something like that. No, but I think I was, like, gripping too hard or, like, trying. I was, like, kind of frat. I don't know. I wasn't, like, very, like, fluid and in the flow of it. And Herb said something interesting when we walked out. He was like, Good luck. Don't try too hard or something like that. Do you remember yeah, when he said that? Yeah. And I feel like I was getting in my own head a little bit. Like I was kind of trying too hard. Yeah. Like, you know, when you try to muscle the line and like, it just doesn't work. Yeah. You just can't muscle it. Yeah. And you actually just have to be like more elegant and efficient with your motion and it's way better. Yeah. And I felt like at times I was the muscling rod didn't it. work. Yeah. So I, I don't think I was casting that well, but I, today I, I fish today. I fish good. Today, I would give myself a better grade than the other day. The first day, I did bad. The second day, I did okay. The third day, I did fine. But I also feel like it just takes me a little bit of time to, like, adjust or something to the river, or at least this trip it did. Yeah. Like, when you... And that's sort of why I love fly fishing. It's almost like yoga or something. Like, you become so immediately aware of where your attention is. Because if you're not paying attention, mm -hmm. you're going to fuck up. And that's when the fish is going to bite. <laughs> yeah. And that's when the fish is going to bite or the fish is going to get off. Okay. You lost how many fish? Um, five, like, I th five fish. Okay. Do you, I know you have, I know you have um, an excuse mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or a reason for losing the fish. But other than. I have an explanation. An explanation. <laughs> other than. The barbless hooks, which the Trinity River is a barbless river. Is there anything you think that you would have done differently to like play those fish or hook those fish that would have landed them? I don't think so. Yeah. I think with like fly equipment, especially when you're nymphing, right? You're on 4X on big fish. Like the fish is largely in control, especially in like fast moving water, which is where most of my fish were hooked. They have the advantage of the fast moving water. They have the advantage of you're on small tippet. They have the advantage of just being big fish with a lot of mass and like they can easily break that line. And so like 
Like you can't choose if they decide to go on a run or not. Mm-hmm. You can't force them up on the beach if they're not ready to go up on the beach. Yeah. There are certainly like things you can do, like not like giving the fish like slack or like if it jumps, like there's different things you can do to manipulate your rod to keep tension on, you know, like yeah. I'm not saying there's no art to playing fish. There certainly is, but I don't feel like, I don't feel like I do when I break my line, which is like user error, you know, and you break. But your why line. do you think breaking line is user error, but this isn't? Because bre- breaking line means that you just, like you allowed the fish to generate too much tension in your line Mm -hmm. and it breaks or you set your drag too tight but why couldn't you just say with in this instance when they get off that you let the hook become too loose because i or the line become too loose and they spit it because i was there and i know that the line wasn't loose my rod was bent in half Mm -hmm. like i I know i mean obviously it wasn't slack but maybe it was too i don't know i'm just wondering yeah no i mean i was i was like just locked in on this fish Mm-hmm. I mean, I've known you to be a, a great and just pops. Great fish fighter. Um, I I totally think that when you break your line on a fish, like <laughs> that is your fault. Yeah. Or like you didn't uh, inspect your knots closely enough, or that happens you, you had a braided line and just said "fuck it," I'm going to keep fishing, or like you set your drag too tight or you were grabbing your line too tight or you were trying to reel when they were going on a, on a run or yeah. you didn't let them run. Like when the line breaks, that's your fault. Yeah. And the hook pops, like it's just certain things you just cannot control. I mean, I just don't think barbless hooks work, especially yeah. when you're talking about like really big acrobatic athletic, um, fish that take a while to get in. Totally. Like, like I said, like you're at their mercy. To a certain extent, like they're not coming in until they're ready, um, and I like certainly think that like with small trout that you can just kind of manhandle and force them in. Maybe the barbless isn't as big of a handicap, but I mean, if you just think like the physics of it, right? Like that fish is turning left, turning right, swimming up, swimming down, um, yeah. thrashing his head around. Like, it's unreasonable to expect that hook to stay put for Did a very long jump? time. None of them jumped. See, sometimes you get the jumpers. That's always fun. None of them jumped. Did the Great Lakes steelhead jump? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. I haven't had one jump in a while. <clears throat> but when I was in high school, I remember they used to jump a lot. They, um, Cataragus Creek. They always jumped a lot in Cataragus mm-hmm. Creek. Um, yeah, so I just don't think barbless hooks work. So would you, if you were the warden of the river slash in charge of whatever was going on in the Trinity, would you allow people to fish with barbs now? Yes, I would. Um, As James talked about, there's just so many issues um, that, you know, are in front of these trout making a recovery. First and foremost, that there's a physical barrier a dam blocking over a hundred miles of their spawning habitat like that's probably a pretty big one right there yeah um large harvest slash and or question mark over harvest on indian reservation land you've got oceanic issues you've got parasitic issues in the klamath arising from the dams on the Klamath. Lack of wild flows, natural flows. You've got lack of wild flows, natural flows. You've got lack of fry rearing habitat. Mm -hmm. You've got U-shape, the the channelization of the river, the U-shape that's forming because of the steady flows. Didn't really see that so much. Yeah. Yeah. But so we're told by the experts that that is a problem. Yeah. Um, Marine mammals that many feel are overabundant and having a heavy predatory effect on the fish. All these things. Um, and my hook is the problem. That's that's what we got to figure out. I wonder... I just don't buy that at all. So you were looking... So what did you read on your phone earlier? Did you learn anything about like the like how harmful the barb is versus not? Like It's obviously a little bit more harmful. I heard something that... Um, we should probably look into this. Fish one. mortality is about double catch and release mortality is about double for barbed hooks versus barbless hooks. Double? 
Yeah. That's that's significant. Well, it may or may not be. Depending on how what their initial rate is. Exactly. Yeah. Like double of nothing is nothing. Exactly. Double of fifty is a hundred. So <laughs> it really depends on what your baseline number is. Yeah. Um, but double from what I understand, the biggest the thing the biggest thing influencing fish mortality and catch and release, I think this is pretty well agreed upon, is water temperature. The lower the oxygen, the closer to that seventy degree number is, uh, the higher the mortality is. So they just get tired. They can't they, breathe. They completely exhaust all their energy yeah. reserves, and they don't don't have enough oxygen to then recover. Is that partly why they like do the fish bans and stuff when the water gets hot and like exhaust the exactly. river in the yeah. in the west? Yeah. The fish are uh, if they exert a lot of energy, they're gonna die. Okay. Um, I've heard people touching them too, like dry hands is not good. Not good either. What right? is that? So there's that all about? even so this is, it goes to say like there's all these different factors. Yeah. Um what the re- that's about they have a slime on them, like yeah. the fish slime. Mm-hmm. That's actually like a very important biological function and it like mostly like protects their skin from um parasites and mm-hmm. like lice and um totally all sorts of other things and keeps their skin healthy. It protects them. Yeah. And so when you touch them with a dry hand, well, that slime layer comes onto your hand and off of their fish. It can be real slimy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying, so where are you going with this? I'm just going with it that I don't think that my hook's the problem. But double. Yeah. Double the, the, the survival, or half the survival I've, rate? I've heard a lot of the time that barbed, okay, barbed hook catch and release mortality rate is like between two and five percent of the fish you release with the barbed hook die so maybe it's one to two and a half percent with the barbless hook interesting maybe up to ten with barb i think maybe we need to do up more to research. five with barbless i mean yeah, i i i've spent enough of my life obsessed with fly fishing to i've heard a lot of discussion around this topic yeah it's not more than ten percent um which means that, like, a fisherman would have to catch 10 fish for one to die from catch and release. Let's say it's the high end number. It's 10%. Yeah. It's about as high as you'll hear quoted. How many steelhead anglers are catching 10 fish? Yeah, but that could be, you could catch one fish and it could be the one of 10. Sure. It's not necessarily about catching 10, but I feel you. That's not that high. And even if, and even if, like, all that is happening. Like, how many fish are getting eaten by seals? How but many fish no are reason. being netted I mean, on we the need reservation? To, we need to, like, this is a, an emergency situation with an anadromous fish. Like, I feel like we need everything we can get. Every okay, so close the fishery. Close the fishery. So you're saying it's no longer fishing to not be using a barbs. It's like, it doesn't... If the whole objective is to not hurt fish, there's a <laughs> great way to not hurt fish, which is to stay home and not go fishing. Yeah. If that's your objective here. Well, don't you think there's a middle ground? Just being a little bit more gentle with the fish goes a long way. And I'm only saying that because, like, to me, hooking a fish and not landing it is a bummer. But it's not going to ruin my day. And I didn't hook fish this weekend. And I would have been, I would feel much better about my weekend if I would have hooked a fish and fought it for two minutes and would have got off. Because then I would have, like, felt that there was a fish in the water. I would have, like, experienced the, like the the tension in my relationship with that fish i had nothing it was like a ghost river for me but you so so for for me the barb would be nice no it wouldn't be nice like obviously i would like to land fish that i hook but it's not to me it's not such a big deal if i don't to me it's soul crushing losing fish it's absolutely soul crushing (laughs) i saw a side of you today that i hadn't seen since we were probably like 14 or something (laughs) Yeah, it. I I need to grow up or something. I don't know. No, Let's, maybe it's a personality flaw that. of mine. But <laughs> it is just. It is. It's devastating. Let's go into that. What what's what is it? What's so painful? I don't know. Maybe it goes back to my evolution or something like that. Just that having something and losing it is just devastating. Wait, when did you almost break your rod today? After my fifth fish. <laughs> the the last one. The last one. Because that was, I put my first cast in the pool, hook up, lose it. Then I threw like one more cast, my third cast in the pool, 
just at the end of the drift, flies are starting to come up. I'm getting tension, getting ready to make my next cast, and then all of a sudden, boom. He hits it almost like it would, like if you're swinging a fly at him. Um, and had him on for maybe 10 seconds, and it popped. And I just, like, screamed. And I was about I you, to yeah. put the rod over my knee. And I don't know how I saved it. If I were still drinking and had even, like, one <laughs> beer in me, that rod would be... I, I would have broken it, like, three times. I would have broken it and then folded it over, broken it again. Okay, so what... It was a heroic display of impulse control. Yeah. Not breaking the rod. I mean, not all heroes wear capes. <laughs> And then bottom of the ninth, you just went like with the most classic flags you yeah. could find. Just back you to basics. This, yeah, you're like, what are like the the, the most elemental, like like versatile, just proven producers. Yeah, you were t- you were saying something cool about the woolly bugger earlier today that it like rep- it can be so many different things. It's which is everything. What- it imitates everything. I think yeah. it's an outstanding stonefly imitation. Yeah, it's a great leech imitation. I think it's a great bait fish imitation. Um, so cool how like and I f- think it's an imitation of just anything big and buggy that fish like to eat. Yeah, I love that. It's interesting. Like I study coyotes, right? Which are obviously like super adaptable creatures, and that's one of the reasons why I find them interesting. Like omnivores can do all these sorts of things, right? Live in a lot of different environments. Maybe we'd call that like they're being, them being generalists or something. But it's interesting yeah. how that kind of uh, quality can also exist just like in a form yeah <laughs> you know it's like the woolly booger itself is just a generalist by nothing that it does but it just like looks like a lot of different things i think How there's, does it do there's that? no question that it is the best pattern there is not a fish on the planet with the exception of the filter feeders that shout will not take a woolly bugger. shout out to your uncle mike right now who literally only uses woolly <laughs> only buggers. uses woolly buggers <laughs> does not fit like I its thought. fly box is just all, all like, like, <laughs> big ones little ones <laughs> white ones black ones that is so beaded iconic. ones non-beaded that. ones but they're all woolly buggers so how did we we started out really on the golden stone fly tip yeah both of us were using it yep that's what i got my fish that, on do you think that like us like wet or like soft tackle imitation that you that we got from the fly shop that you caught the first fish on, or your only fish on. Yeah. Do you think that's also a stone fly imitation? Yes. Stone? Yeah. I it's did. just like a smaller one. Yeah. It's definitely a stone fly. Yeah. What is the soft hackle? Is it just supposed to be like water? It's like supposed to be swimming through the water or something? No, it, it just... Um, I My personal theory is that fly fishermen get a little bit too full on themselves sometimes with like oh, like, this one is, like, the the Trinity River, like, May, Spring, Golden <laughs> Mayfly. Like, <laughs> it's, like, and it's, like, and you can tell because it has, like, three wraps of white thread around the abdomen, like, a... Yeah. Like, I think that all flies are just, like, forms that, like, resemble forms that appear in nature. Or, like, they're, like... Uh, they have features that are suggestive of movement or like mm-hmm. features that are suggestive of um, a particular shape that a lot of bugs are or whatever. And so I you th- don't think they're like I, supposed to be very specific insect patterns? Or- like I th- those obviously do exist, but I think yeah. it's more to pleasure fishermen than to pleasure fish. That's a hot take. Yeah. I mean, I always remember going to the fly shop near the Andrew Scoggin. What is it? What was that fly shop where we meet that guy who would always tell us what the special fly was? Yeah, Roland. Roland. Yeah. I remember that somehow I associated with that fly shop, but your dad always would be like that. Like we would pick flies or whatever, and your dad would be like, "That's a fly that catches fishermen, not fish." Yeah, yeah. And I think that's super real, obviously. No, I I totally think it's real. Um, okay, this is just my theory, but I think that like size 
And like, not even color, but like shade. Like, is it a light shade or a dark shade? Or white? And That's think, important or no? I, no? I think it's important. I think that like size is important. I think shade is important. And by shade, all I mean, again, is black, white, or something in the middle. And then I think, um, like, overall, pro is it, like, a really skinny thing? Like, a midge is really skinny, so you mm -hmm. just, like, wrap thread around your hook. Whereas, like, a stone fly is a really beefy fly, so it needs to be, the fly needs to be beefy. Yeah. Like shape, profile. Yeah. Um, but what about, like, something like this Psycho Princeton? Just like all this gold, purple shine. Yeah. What about reflective? I think ref there might be some. That's not really. Yeah, I think that might might make a difference too. Because insects shells I'll, I'll, kind of are like translucent that. in that way, or like what would you call it? I also think that it is just triggering to the fish. Like yeah. I don't think it's necessarily like a psycho prince is great because it like mimics the sheen on a exoskeleton. Yeah. Like I think it's just like the fish is like, oh bright. Like, What's that? Yeah. Like, the yeah. trout has no way of exploring the world around it except through its mouth. What about its scent? Yeah, but, like, that was it can't, like, like, touch it, you know? That was one of the interesting, something interesting you told me today was that, like, those, what were those guys called who were using the row? Bouncing? The center pin. The center pin. How that's, they fish mostly in the slow water, and it's mostly about scent. Because yeah. those that those bags of row look nothing like anything in nature. No. Well, maybe, like, a sack of eggs floating down the the river yeah but it's wrapped in cheesecloth and tied off with a tied at the top and where's the hook sitting that? they just hook it through the cheesecloth <laughs> okay yeah but so that's all scent based so they just like kind of swim up to it and they're like oh my god that smells amazing and can't resist biting it yeah but then fly fishing is totally not scent based yeah it's all visual yeah we're trying to trick their their vision and they're trying to trick their noses do you remember this moment on the wild river when we were kids we had been fly fishing with flies or whatever, and then we found some of those, what are those little bugs called? The Helgramites. The Helgramites. Yeah. And we just put those things on. <laughs> it was on. Like the best oh, fishing up we, imaginable. But it was, it was, I didn't even think, it was like orders of magnitude better. Yeah. Because we put a real insect on the hook. Yeah. They went crazy for those Helgramites. But... I thought the flies would be doing a little bit better than that, but compared to the actual thing... I didn't know there were that many fish in the river. <laughs> I didn't. I had no clue that there were that many fish. But don't you think it would be, like, the, it wouldn't have been that big of a difference between it the Helgramite and the actual fly? It still is shocking to me, and it was shocking to me then how effective those were. Do you think that was because it was, like, a combination of scent and visual, or if there, there was maybe motion to it? That, like, why, was, why were those so much all, more obviously delicious the to the trout? All of the above, yeah. It's just like... We well, because it's a real Helgramite. But you just said all of these things don't matter. That it's like like not that important, the details. Unless it's a Helgramite. Unless it's the real thing, then the details <laughs> yeah. are super important. <laughs> well, the real thing is the real thing. We're trying to imitate the real thing. Yeah. But what? But then why wouldn't the details be that important for the fly? But then, I but then when it's the real thing... What really matters is the fact that it's the real thing and not an imitation, which can only come across in the details. Or maybe there's something like about the whole image or whole experience of encountering the real thing that you, where you're just like, yeah, I, I know that's real. It, it's everything. I think it's the scent. I think it's the movement. I think it's the sight. I think it's just like they've been eating Helgramites their whole life and they love them. <laughs> I just, yeah, I think, I honestly think that, like, size and profile are probably the two most important things, as yeah. long as you get those right. And I do think hackle can help, because I think that, like, a soft hackle, like, and, or just regular hackle on a woolly bugger, like, I think it just, like, it gives the impression of movement, is the best way I've heard it described. Because mm. all those little hackles are, like, wiggling in the micro yeah. um, currents and stuff like that. Well, the, the fly I was using at the end of most of the day was that big black stone fly imitation that has, like, the, what, do you, what is it called, chenille around the middle? What's yeah, that, like? It's, it's like, chenille. And then that has the rub, big rubber legs that stick out the sides. It's basically yeah. just, like, a long chenille thing. Yeah. Like rubber leg. And those rubber legs, I'm sure, in the water look. Wiggle around. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a good example of a fly that has like very little details, but is like pretty dang effective. Yeah. I mean, look at the woolly bugger. It's not like a detailed fly. No. Oh, but that's why it's good. Yeah, because it's everything. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if I was getting them on the... Because I got three today with that rig. Or I hooked three with that rig. But you don't know on which fly. I don't know on which fly. I tend to think the woolly bugger. What, what did you fish this morning at the honey hole? I fished. I started with an egg pattern and a golden stone fly. I like like it I, over maybe t- like an hour and a half. I worked from the top of the pool to the bottom of the pool. When I got to the bottom, I got out and I switched to the woolly bugger and the prince sniff and went back to the top. And but when I made it to about the middle of the pool, my second round through is when I hooked that fish on the woolly bugger pr- prince. On the woolly bugger prince. Interesting. I mean, I wonder if it's just the black stone fly. I mean, that's what it would be as a as a drift. In that situation. Yeah. I have a feeling that, I mean, everywhere we were going, we were hearing golden stone, golden stone, golden stone. I think that that might have been hot a week ago, two weeks ago after these rains. People slammed them with that. Yeah. And now it's just over. It's not like they're not looking for those anymore. Or they're well, wearing they've probably those. all been hooked on them. They've all been hooked on them. I mean, it's. I wonder like how many fish in the river get hooked you know, each week or whatever. Like, I wonder what pressure does to steelhead. Because they're not like trout where they're just like in the same hole for most of their life or in the same certain stretch of river. I bet most, I bet more than 50% of the fish that make it up to the Trinity River Dam um, have like at least one encounter with like artificial flies. More than 50%. More than 50%. Yeah, that's pretty low. If that's the case, then I doubt like, they would be on to the golden stone fly pattern in general. No, but what you're not taking account of is a lot of them like wouldn't be fooled anyway, or just like aren't aggressive fish. Or, like, yeah. I just think like some fish are like just like really aggressive and are just prone to snap at anything. Yeah. And then other fish are not like that. They're a little bit more naturally. Like you see this in deer all the time, but like deer totally have like individual personalities and some of them are like, Fighters. Some of yeah. them are like really shy and weary. We call this some the bold, them... shy axis in animal behavior. Is that right? Yeah, it's like the one of the. It's like the main way people like designate personality to animals. Yeah, because it's easy to study because you just do something called like a novel stimuli test, mm. and like the quickness with which they approach the novel stimuli determines yeah. whether or not they're bold or shy. Well, boom! I think that's what's. I think. Trout exist on a bull chai axis. You said something interesting earlier about like why you, because I was swinging a streamer sometime today and you're like, no, I was like trying to convince you to do it. And you're like, no, because every fish that will hit a streamer will take a nymph, but not every fish will hit a stream that will take a nymph will hit a streamer. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that bull chai axis thing again. So only a bold fish will hit a streamer. Correct. Where all fish need to eat. So Correct. they're going to take the nymphs. Correct. But what is that? But how does that translate into, like, statistics or odds for you? Because there's not this, like, who's to say that, like, the one bold fish in the pool is not going to take the streamer every time. But, like, you might not get something to take your nymph because there's a lot of nymphs in the water. Yeah. But I'm hitting that thing with that nymph (laughs) a lot. (laughs) I'm putting that thing over, putting them over, over, putting them over. I don't know. I I just... uh... To me, I, I don't think that this is controversial at all. Um, your odds, if you're just interested in catching a fish, your odds yeah. are best with the No, I think that's right. Nymph rig. It's really hard to do some adaptive management right now because we have very little data. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I'm like trying to even think like, what did we learn about the river? But it's like, it's hard to say you learned much when we got very little intel. I learned that Barlow's hooks don't work, and I'm going to throw all of them away when I get home. Just give them to me. I'm going to, like, bury them in, like, a like six-inch thick, like, lead chamber to just <laughs> so that no one is ever unfortunate enough 500 years from now to, like, find them digging through a garbage <laughs> dump and think that they're going to take them to Yucca Mountain. Yeah. And they I'm, put all the nuclear waste. Yeah. Dump it way down in the bottom <laughs> of those. <laughs> Okay. I still think... I'm still a fan of Barbless, but 
What do I know? I didn't even hook a fish. If I'm really, like, if my intention is just, like, to have the littlest impact possible on a fishery, then I'll just go hunting. <laughs> I, that, like, threw me for a loop. I was like, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. I get what you're saying. If I'm fishing, I want to fish and I want to catch fish. But I guess this just goes to, sh- to the point of, like, what we mean by fishing. Because, like, to me, I don't think fishing means catching. I think it's much about a lot of other things that include losing fish. So I'm fine if my odds are a little bit lower for landing fish. I don't think that fishing means catching either. However, I want a reasonable... and gets into how you define reasonable. Different people are going to define reasonable. This is going to the Supreme Court. However, I think there should be a reasonable chance of landing a fish that you hook, and I think there should be a reasonable chance of catching fish. According to the way that I define reasonable, barbless hooks do not fit that criteria. (laughs) Okay. Okay. I think you need to land a fish on a barbless hooks, and then we'll talk. Then we'll reassess. Right now, it's just you've lost all of your fish. Yeah. So I understand why you think they're unreasonable. Yeah. But maybe after you land an adult steelhead, you, you'll have a slightly different feeling. Yeah. to say that these three days were the most beautiful days I've had on the on the Trinity River ever I'd say like the clouds the sun it was warm yeah. the insects coming off yeah the water was low at times and clear but it was still looking really good yeah there was a lot of good holes yeah some re- I really liked that spot that um dark waters yeah i thought that was such a beautiful section of river and i'm so surprised i never went to that before really good Taking section of river definitely a really good section of river yeah the temps were great the light i love the the way the fog burned off how that you know we, how the fish in the honey hole hit right when the sun hit the water right yeah insane immediately beautiful river gorgeous unbelievable mayfly hatches yeah they were going off. Unbelievable. This was the first time I've ever seen sipping happening. Yeah. I haven't seen fish rise ever on the Trinity, much less in January. Yeah. I couldn't believe I was seeing that level of insect activity in January. Yeah. Like prolific hatches. Yeah. And I don't know if they're hatches. I guess they were. I don't know. They were adults. And I think that what we were seeing mostly was adults laying, not adults emerging what was that you were telling about the, eggs. about the what which way they always fly oh yeah caddis flies stone flies may flies all of them if you ever, next time you're on the river look today this is true they're always flying upstream is that so the explanation for that is that if they if as the adult winged version of themselves if they weren't flying upstream they would all get washed into the ocean and be ocean insects well once they're in the water from the egg phase all the way up through the emerger phase they're moving down river that's not questionable well they could walk up river on the rocks or swim or something no yeah yeah but at what rate and how often if like let's say an insect was like you know what i'm going on a journey today I'm going to go upstream. Just hop on the back of a truck. What is the probability that like, okay, let's say they spend all day and they make it like a hundred yards, you know, like (laughs) that's pretty good. Okay. Then they make one wrong step and And now they're they're adrift in the current and they're either lunch or they drift 500 yards (laughs) downstream. (laughs) Yeah. So then when they hatch and they're in flies, they all have to fly. Out. That's their only opportunity to move the other way in their entire life cycle. So in like a couple generations, all the, all the insect life would be down in the ocean if they didn't, 
in their adult phase fly upstream. It's like they're fucking dreaming when they're flying. It's like they're, they're it's like a completely different world for them. Yeah. Probably a completely different state of consciousness. Totally different. Like they're not even. Do you the think same they remember themselves being. before? I don't think that they have memory. No. Really? I don't think that they have memory. No. None. I don't think so. Well, the body memory remember. Well, how would they be flying upstream then? Instincts. It's like saying, like, how does like a bear know to eat? It just gets hungry and eats. And so it's just flying up because it's like programmed to do it's it. It's what they do. Yeah. Well, like, and the ones that aren't programmed to do that fly downstream, and their offspring are in the ocean, and they're dead. That genetic line is <laughs> over. Yeah. Their offspring are not in the ocean, but something else must have happened. Yeah, how would that even select for? How the ones that fly upstream get to continue to be in that part of the river, and the ones that don't fly upstream don't. Wouldn't they just be in the lower part of the river, though? Yeah, but then, okay, the ones in the lower part of the river. Let's say they do this again. I would be the one to fly downstream, but still flourish for, like, the next thousand years. And then your entire genetic mm, line is in the ocean. I don't think that far ahead. <laughs> Yeah, they always fly upstream. I mean, it, 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 it bore out today, that truth. Yeah. We saw them. But anyways, the hatch was, was big. Every they day. were every single day. Yeah. Oh, I want to fish. I want to do... These, like, perfect classic mayflies, too. Yeah, with the little, like, the, They're the just body like, that was just, like... Whoop. With the, the long two tails and yeah. the parachute wings and... Yeah, I think, what were they? beautiful the, the, One of the patterns that um, Herb told us to use was a... Was a Morning dove or pit? No, no blueing blue. olive. Blueing olive, that's right. But a blueing olive, again, is just like, like mayfly biology is so complex. Like we still like haven't even come close or even tried to like document all the different like species of mayfly. When we say blueing olive, people they think that they're talking about like a species of mayfly. Mm -hmm. But all we do, we're just like, oh yeah, it's kind of bluish olive-ish. So it then becomes a blueing olive. Like, it's not like a descriptive term. Like, it just is a, it's just like a I mean, this way is what talking. they look like. Yeah, that, but they're all different species and they're yeah. all kind of bluish and olive-ish. But it's totally, they, I see why the blueing olive. And then like another choice. species might be like a little bit paler, whiter. It's like, that's a PMD, pale morning done. I switched to a dry for like two seconds and I broke it off and then I got cold feet and I went back to nymphing. Yeah. I wish I would have stuck with it. How'd you break off a dry fly? On the on something behind me. Oh. I'm telling you. I was I was out of tune. Yeah. Just to tell you how out of sync I was this trip, I <laughs> I forgot my waiters this morning. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Anyways. One time I was hunting with my dad. I mean, it was like a hour and a half drive to where we were going in the morning. We got up at like three o'clock in the morning. We were like, had like a whole plan set in place. We could drive an hour and a half. We're like psyched to get out to like where we saw a deer the day before. <laughs> and we get in there and I left my boots back at the motel. <laughs> was he so mad? He was so mad. <laughs> I mean, I. I'm entire, just forgetful. Entire day was shot. Are you forgetful? Um, I used to be more forgetful than I am now. I've I'm gotten bad. less forgetful as time's gone on. I'm real bad. Still. I was actually very forgetful as a child, but I'm not anymore. Remember when I left the binoculars on the tripod at the top of the mountain at Clear Creek? <laughs> yep. That was bad. Yeah. I've become less forgetful since I stopped smoking weed and drinking alcohol. I'm sure. I've become less forgetful. Another thing I learned this trip that you taught me was to grease up the fly line before you fish. Yeah, grease Remind that. me to give that to you. Leader. That stuff really did work. It really works. And it's helpful. It makes a big difference. The like type of trip. men that you can make where the line just, like, you just flick the rod and the yeah. whole line all the way out to the indicator just flops over. It's like zero effort. You can't do that unless it's greased. Yeah. I'm going to definitely get some grease. What else? Um, Are you ever going to come back? I don't know. This trip, I was like thinking, I just, 
I don't know. I, I, I feel like this river is a little bit intimidating hmm. in a way. I think it goads you into making certain river crossings that you mm. probably shouldn't make. Mm. Like I was like, safety was on my mind a lot this trip. Cause I just like really, like I couldn't help but think multiple times. That, like, wow, like this is how people drowned yeah. like, right here. This is, this is what they're doing. And then one bad step. I was actually thinking too, about. remember how I was saying, I don't really understand how you could drown. Yeah. I think what I miscalculated was the fact that my wading boots are on. Yeah. If I had wading, I don't think you could swim at all. Because you, you couldn't kick or anything. And they're heavy. Yeah. So your whole buoyancy, because I've always thought that too, like, okay, if I ever got in like real trouble, like I can just float on my back. Like just like take a big, in, like your buoyancy is like practically neutral. Yeah, no. Like you can just float. Yeah. But if you have all that gear on and you have your wading boots on, which are so heavy, they're going to pull you down. Would you try to swim or would you like try to take them off? You couldn't take them off. <laughs> like just untying them, pulling them off underwater. No way. Your... I can't hold my breath that long. And you'd be so like disheveled. Like yeah. you wouldn't have like the Ugh, state is, of mind. This is scary. I don't like, I don't, I guess it's good to have a plan. I think I would try like just, I'd like, to make my way either to the side or to like the tail of the pool where I could stand up. Yeah. There's never like huge stretches of deep water. There's a, mm, I don't know if I agree with that, man. Like what if you got washed into the pool that we went to after the honey hole? That one was the, was it the most dangerous one? And I almost went in that one. Did you see me? Cause I was trying to kind of get up. And that had it. some wicked eddies in it that like could pull you under. You ever notice when you're nymphing over an eddy, how your line, line just gets goes pulled down way That's down how like it would happen. Yeah. What's go- Yeah. I hate that. Cause I would always, I always want my fly to drift in that eddy a little bit. Cause you yeah. imagine it's just a buffet. Yeah. And it just pulls your line pulls right down. down. Yeah. Yeah. I almost went in there. I was trying to kind of get to that. Like other that would have been pool. bad. Not good. And the Trinity is always tempting you on these various river crossings. And I took the bait a couple times. Well, it's to me, it's the perfect size river because it's just, just small enough that you could pretty much cross it almost every place. No, I couldn't disagree with that more, Chase. There's select areas where you can tr- try you to cross. You can cross at every, any place, obviously. But what I'm saying is it's as big as a river can be while still allowing you to cross it. If and you were to me, draw size lines river. perpendicular to the direction of flow, the mean direction of flow, yeah, across the entire river at one foot interval intervals, yeah, what percentage of those lines do you think you could cross at, or not could cross at, but would cross at? Like twelve? No, percentage. I think Six? it's like five. Less. I think it's like two percent. No, we crossed a bunch of times every yeah, day. Yeah, but those are at like very targeted locations. Okay, but every, you don't have to walk like 100 yards or 200 yards to find a good crossing. Or maybe that's the most you'd have to walk to find a good crossing. In the upper river, yes. Yeah. In the lower river? Mm-hmm. I don't think, I think it's fewer than that. I don't know. I, don't, I usually don't have a hard time crossing the place that was the meanest part of the river we fished this trip was down douglas city near the bottom by the goat farm yeah you couldn't cross any of that no, shit that was bad i don't know why i think it was just kind of the, the the rocks in the river there were pretty intense yeah it really has a lot of different characters the train each section has its own vibe in a way yeah yeah that part down there spoke to me like like, we don't watch you here. Like, yeah, you don't belong it was me. Here. I just kept thinking the whole time, this is mean river, mean river, mean river. Yeah. Slippery. Dark. Big rocks, dark. Ugh. Yeah. No gravel. Yeah. Maybe they need to restore that part. And, like, even the banks at most places, like, you couldn't, like, the bank was, like, six feet down. Well, the right bramble off the bush, bank. The blackberry bushes up there. Was With the so bushes weird. up top, yeah. Everything was just, like, keep out, stay away from me. <laughs> So, yeah. you're gonna, so you're going to come back? You're going to fish to Trinity? No. Don't say that. I feel like I failed if, if you never come back. I, 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 really, I really don't like fishing without barbs. Without barb tucks. 
it's not the river. It's not the steelhead. It's not the productivity of the river. It's not the beauty of the river. It's just, if I'm going to choose to take my precious vacation time, like I spend so much time working or like doing things that You're I have, taking a vacation have, off. that I have to do. So like, and like life's only so long. <laughs> So, like, with the precious time that you have for leisure, for, like, doing cool things, I don't want to spend that time fishing with, barb- with barbless hooks. I'll just I, go somewhere where I can fish with barbed hooks. I failed hooks. you and the Trinity by being, by not properly guiding you this weekend. No, I you did. You it. put me on fish. I Hardly. By fish. But here's the thing. You went steelhead fishing on the Trinity River, which, if you hooked five fish, which... I would call it more like two because, or three, because you also, the other two that you hooked were on for just less than 10 seconds, which I don't necessarily count. You hooked three fish and landed one, and it wasn't a, an adult. You hooked two adult steelheads for sure yeah. and didn't land either of them. That's normal. That's just what happens when you fish for steelhead, I feel No, like. it's not, though, because I've fished for steelhead a lot. In the Great Lakes. And I showed you pictures of those steelhead. They're not bitch-ass freshwater steelhead. They're like fucking No, I know. Big they're big fish. fish. And they're real. And like they fight like crazy. Like they're steelhead. I don't know. The they're odds. genetically the same. They obviously have equal to, if not better in some cases, access to nutrition in the Great Lakes. Like, I'm not trying to compare those to these. I mean, like they're they fight similar and different. They fight incredibly hard. They're the same fish. But I'm just saying, I don't think it's outrageous that we fish with barbs and like we land, like you break off a lot of fish and you certainly lose some fish, but you don't go like over on all the adult fish that you hook. But you went over two, which is like not that crazy. I think I went over four because I do count those other two that I hooked today. But you didn't feel them. I did. No, you felt them as fish, but you weren't like, that's an adult steelhead for sure. Okay, but I still lost them. Yeah, yeah. I think one of them felt bigger than the other. One of them felt small. The second one felt small when the flies were rising. When I was fighting that fish, it just it didn't feel that big. The first one felt pretty... Uh, not, like the, not like the one in the honey hole, but just didn't feel like a half pounder. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Well, I'll be sad if you don't come back because... Um there's a lot more fish to catch in this river, I think. And I also really want to fish the South Fork one of these days. We need to look up the regs. I feel like I'm very good. I think I should be better about this. But, like, any time I go hunting, um, particularly for, like, a new species in a new state, I, like, every fish and game department publishes the regs a lot of them will send you their regs it's like a booklet maybe 50 60 pages usually of all the regulate hunting regulations in that state and i i i read the book Mm -hmm. um and i just like don't i've never like looked at fishing that way the way i do with hunting like with hunting like it's like unacceptable to not be aware of the regs it's um, more regulated than fishing. It feels yeah, like. and I feel like like it is my responsibility to read the regs and like know all the regs when I'm out in the field. Whereas with fishing, I I just like I don't know. I think it's because I was like I've been fishing since I was like four years old and just like raised in it that I just kind of take it for granted or yeah. think it's like less serious or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, I had no idea that we could have gotten regs. fined seven hundred dollars for not just filling out our steelhead punch card each day. Yeah. That's intense. I'm going to do that from now on because I never do that. Yeah. I do it at the, I usually have done it at the end of the season and been like, how many days did I finish? Blah, blah. And it's like, yeah. I completely fudge it probably. Um, but what I really am curious about is do you have to use barbless hooks in every river? Is that a steelhead regulation? Is that a Trinity River regulation? <laughs> it's a Trinity is it river. even a regulation in the Trinity River? I think have it is. Have you ever read the regs? At least in the upper river, I think it is. Have you ever read the regs? No, not like all of them, but I have seen barbless hooks stated quite a bit in the Trinity, but maybe we should look that up for good. Yeah. 
I'm telling you, it's also just like when you see that river steaming, it just looks like you can feel that it's magical. Like it has a different feel than the Trinity. How would you describe the feel based on your understanding? You know how that one part in Douglas City was kind of like dark and scary? Yeah. Compared to the Trinity, all of the Trinity feels kind of like dark and scary and spooky and mean. And the South Fork feels like very like bright and fluid and just snatched. Is it more open because of the floodplain and yeah, high water it's, flow? It's, sh- it's like shallower and more dynamic. It just somehow feel you can tell that the water is not coming out of a dam. Yeah. And you can really feel it. Yeah. And I didn't really think about it much. The Trinity when I saw it. does kind of feel like a tailwater. I mean, it is a tailwater. You mean like a dam, a river coming out of a dam? Yeah. Yeah, it, it does feel that way. Yeah. And there's something, je ne sais quoi, like there's some kind of feeling you get in a wild river. Mm-hmm. And when I saw it over Thanksgiving, because I just wanted to fish because I'd never fish it, I as soon as I saw the water, I was like, whoa. Yeah. But I didn't make the connection between it being a wild river and the Trinity being a tailwater until after we spoke with Herb. Yeah. I think um, talking with James, he kind of helped me understand this but you can totally tell and i'm not i don't know if what you're talking about is like in a metaphysical sense i mean like in a very like real sense like if you just put me in a river i can usually kind of guess if it's like a yeah. spring creek or a tailwater or freestone stream yeah you can just like i can look around and definitely like tell what kind of river it is um and i think he helped me kind of understand like why that is like yeah. why a tailwater looks different as totally. far as like the consistent flows and what effects that has on like the morphology of the river. Same. Um, and yeah, I don't know if like the Trinity maybe would be like a little bit less obvious in certain places, but I do think if you put a gun to my head, I would probably say that it was a, a tailwater. And certain sections look more like a, a tailwater certain, than others for sure. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It, the, depending on the section. Yeah. No, I, t- I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think talking to James and also reading more about the TRRP, not this report, but like their yearly report and like learning more about all the things they're trying to do to the Trinity to like rehabilitate it and make it a wild river or yeah. at least feel more like a wild river to trout yeah. makes you even more keyed into those, those qualities. Yeah. But in any case, I, I guess think- it's the floodplain, right? Just like freestone streams have huge floodplains. It's the floodplain, but I also think it's something a little bit harder to put your finger on. Like, there's obviously qualities you no, can No, but it's, 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 you don't have, like, it's, it's, it's more of a, how, do, how would you say? Less of a U-shape, more of a wider, kind of mm-hmm. shallower kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's more movement. Yeah. It's not, there's not, like, trees growing near the bank. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's more of a where the water you feel that the water is in places where it's not at the moment yeah and the trinity you don't feel that way yeah you're like the water's there and like it's the wild usually river. there yes the wild river is a great example it's yeah. like there's so much river that's not water yeah i used to think that like that was like because like back in the day it was such a big river no, it's because in the spring <laughs> yeah recently i think it was um hurricane sandy yeah there are videos on youtube some dude in new hampshire took a video of the wild river at one of the bridges and posted it to youtube and like somehow our family found it and i bet it was running at a hundred thousand cfs crazy it was gigantic up in the woods blowing over trees (laughs) like (laughs) just have you you fished that all in the last like what five years no i haven't i haven't been back there in a while flows man yeah all right, I'm ready for a cupcake. Yeah. You better come back to the train after this or I'll kill you. <laughs> I'll think about it. No regulations. So, 
the whole the whole rest of the river downstream of the Lewiston Bridge. The regs do not say that you have to use barbless hooks <laughs> above the bridge. When when did you who told you that you had to use barbless hooks? You have insisted on that this entire trip. Did I say that? Yes, you did. Oh my god, this is unbelievable. <laughs> I don't think I literally said that. You've said that. Why was I using barbless hooks? I, I didn't know. do it I thought, because I felt like I it. thought that like you've heard about it somewhere, like no. you read about it in Oh my god. in the fly Chase. shop. Chase. This is so frustrating, dude. <laughs> this is so frustrating. Wait, this is a, amazing news because it means you're definitely coming back. Yeah, okay. Maybe Here. you'll New River main stem, only artificial lures with barbless hooks may be used. Mm. Yeah, that's it, man. Just above the Lewiston, uh, in the Trinity River river system, above the Lewiston Bridge, and in the New River, artificial f- flies with barbless hooks only. Everywhere else, no take regulations. No method of take regulations. Damn. Cool. Unfucking believable. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Unfucking believable. I, I, you know, now that I think about it, I think I did know that. Don't say that. But I just was like under the assumption that it was like best practice to use barbs. Dude, I'm barbless. Gonna put you in a rear naked <laughs> choke. <laughs> but you know, will you fish the new river though when we go hunting in September? Because no. that's where I wanted to do the blasting cast. No, I will not <laughs> fish that river. I'm, I told you, rest of my life, I'm not fishing anywhere with this barbless hooks regulations. All right. I now you know that hunt, the Trinity fish, we'll go there. downstream of the old Lewiston Bridge, I can go back to now. Damn, I can't believe that. Yeah. We could have been eating steelhead right now. Yep. I'm sorry. I really am. <laughs> That's why you got to read the regs, man. I asked you, I was like, are you sure? <laughs> and Did you, you really? said yes. Remember that? I just asked you. That. But now I'm in this very strange position where I'm like, I knew that, but then like at the time, I just wanted to believe that it was barbless everywhere. But like now, if now that I'm like reflecting, I'm like, oh yeah, above the Lewiston Bridge in the fly fishing only section, that's definitely barbless. Are you? I can't read your. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. Well, I asked you more than once if you're sure, and you said <laughs> no. Yes. You didn't. Chase. I asked you like literally five minutes ago if you were sure. And you said that you were sure. Sorry.